Greg, do you want to hear a real, real ghost story? Okay. Okay. So this one really happened. Uh huh. Once upon a time, there was this old man, and he was sitting outside of his big old house, right? And he was super sad because his wife had just died mm -hmm. recently. Now, he's sitting there in this big chair outside the house, and he hears a voice calling inside the house. Mm -hmm. Mervin. Mervin. Mervin isn't a very good name for a ghost story. Oh, shut up. It really happened, and his name was Mervin. Okay, so... The voice kept calling, Mervin. And finally, he went up in, inside to, to check on the voice, mm -hmm. right? Nobody there. But then, there's a giant loud crash outside the house. He rushes out and sees a heavy iron rain gutter had fallen and smashed the chair where he had just been sitting. <sighs> that could happen. Mm -hmm. Home repairs. Oh, there's this other story about, and it's a true one too, this poor girl got invited to a fancy dress ball, but she was really poor and she couldn't afford a dress. So she just rents one from a pawnbroker, and as soon as she puts the dress on, she hears this voice, take off my dress. Well, she goes to the ball, but she starts getting sicker and sicker, and she hears the voice again and again, that's my dress, take off my dress. And then she just died. They found out in the autopsy that she had been poisoned by toxic embalming chemicals that had seeped from the dress. Turns out that the pawnbroker had taken the dress off a dead woman right before they nailed up the coffin. Huh. I've had clothes like that. Oh, here's a good one. There once was a greedy old businessman. Mm -hmm. He met this woman who always wore these nice long gloves because she had a fake hand made out of gold. Now, he was so greedy that he married her, slowly poisoned her, and then took the hand. He always slept with it every night underneath his pillow until Ooh. one night the ghost of his wife came back from the dead. When they found him the next morning, he was strangled with the gold hand wrapped around his throat. A gold hand? I don't believe it. Let's do a proper story. Hello, goblins, ghosts, and ghouls. I'm Damien from Yellow Tree Theater. And I'm Craig. We... Are you ready for some spooky tales? Ooh. Today, we have six great ghost stories from days of yore that still might creep you out, but just a little bit. Let's start with one for the kids. Now, suppose it's an October evening, oh, maybe 100 or 150 years ago, and Dad is going to tell a little story, a bedtime story, to the kids. So. He gets the book, Good Stories for Great Holidays, opens it up to the Halloween section, and begins this classic German fairy tale by the Brothers Grimm. Once upon a time, there was a little girl who was very willful and never obeyed her elders. So how could she be happy? One day, she said to her parents, I have heard so much about the old witch who lives in the forest, so I will go and see her. People say she is a wonderful old woman and has many marvelous things in her house. But her parents forbade her, saying, The witch is a wicked old woman who performs dark deeds. If you go near her, you are no child of ours. But the girl just tossed her curls and <laughs> set off through the forest. Along the way, her assurance turned to fear for the things she saw and the people she met. When she arrived at the witch's cottage, the old woman answered the door. Oh, my dear child, you look dreadfully pale. I have frightened myself with what I have seen. And what did you see, my fair little one? I saw a man in the woods, all dressed in black. Oh, that was only the coal man who keeps my house warm. Oh, I then saw a man all dressed in gray. That was merely the sportsman who supplies me with game. After him, I saw a man all oh, 
blood red was he? That was simply the butcher who dresses the game I cook. But oh, I was most terrified when I peeped through your window and saw not you, but a horrible creature with a fiery head. Then you have seen the witch in her proper dress. For you I have long waited, and now, my pretty, you shall give me light. So saying, the witch changed the little girl into a log and threw her onto the fire. As the blaze roared, the witch resumed her seat by the hearth and warmed herself. How good I feel. This fire has not burned so bright in a long, long time. Good night, kids. Sweet dreams. Uh, wow, Craig. I have a baby girl. I'm gonna be sure to never tell her that story. Oh, fine. Here's a proper, proper story. Mary Wilkins' tale of a haunted boarding house called The Hall Bedroom. My name is Giuseppe Prado. I am a respectable businessman. I was an apothecary in the old country, but I could not find this job in America so I leased a large house by the Mineral Springs. Very cheap. They say Americans come here to rest and get well. So maybe I meet people, yes? Soon my boarding house goes so well and I am making my way in America. But then it begins. Strange things. People begin to leave. Now I must find a new house in a new town. You don't believe? Well, I don't tell the story myself. Here is the journal of Mr. George H. Whitcroft, beginning with the date he arrived. January 18, 1883. Here I am, established in my new boarding house. I have, as befits my humble means, the hall bedroom on the third floor, only as wide as the hall itself with a single window at one end. I have lost in everything. I have lost in strength. I have lost in love. I have lost in money. I now must live on my small income and try to regain my health. On the wall hangs a large painting in a tarnished gold frame, a conventional landscape, the winding river with the little boat the pair of lovers, the cottage. For some reason, the picture bothers me. I find myself gazing at it all the time. January 26th, I feel distinctly better. Maybe it's the mineral water cure or the change in air or possibly something more subtle. That picture, perhaps. Good morning, Signor Prado. I wonder if I might have a word with you. See, si, Mr. Whitcroft. Mm -hmm. Anything wrong? Oh, no, nothing, really. It's just that I should like to have that large painting removed. But why? Uh, well, no special reason. I just don't fancy it. And really, it's far too large for such a small room. True, but it was there when I leased the house. The agent was quite strict about leaving things intact. I shouldn't want to risk upsetting my position, you know? Yes, of course. Well, it's not a pressing matter, I suppose. Grazie, signor. But besides, it would leave quite a mark on the wallpaper. So I let the picture remain. But last night, I had a strange experience. There is something about this room and that picture. I take a medicine prescribed by a specialist every four hours. At night, I always place my bottle and spoon on the dresser where I can put my hand upon them without lighting the gaslight. Last night, I awakened as usual with a slight feeling of refreshment. I got out of bed and stepped across the room to my dresser. To my utter amazement, I advanced several paces and my outstretched hands touched nothing. I stopped. I was sure I was moving in the right direction, and even if I had not, it was impossible to step in any direction without coming to a wall or a piece of furniture. I continued walking, but felt nothing. The room was perfectly dark. I, I could not even distinguish my window. I turned. Now, if I keep on, I will find my writing table, or if I'm going in the opposite direction, the hall door. 
but I reached neither. I began to carefully measure my paces. I traversed a clear space at least 20 by 30 feet. And as I walked, I felt that my feet were pressing not the floor, but something as elastic as air or water, giving a curious sensation of buoyancy and fluidity. What is this? Who is doing this? Suddenly, a light flickered through the window above my door. Mr. Withdraw, are you all right? I saw the familiar hall bedroom, my tumbled bed, the writing table, the dresser, the picture on the wall gleamed. The river seemed to run and ripple and the boat glided with the current. Nothing is the matter, why do you ask? I heard you shout. Oh, I'm all right. I was trying to find my medicine in the dark. I, I can see now that you've lit the gas. Everything good then? Uh, yes. Sorry I disturbed you. Good night. January 27th. Last night, my strange experience deepened. I took the precaution to place beside my bed a box of matches. I took my medicine and had three hours of sound, dreamless slumber before I awoke. I lay a few minutes hesitating whether or not to strike a match, but I simply picked up the box and started straight for the dresser, five feet away. I traveled and traveled with groping hands, setting one foot before the other. All of a sudden though, I became aware of a scent, roses, then another step and another fragrance, lilies, then violets, lilacs. <laughs> I seemed to be wading through flower beds, but all the time I felt nothing. At last, I feared some unknown peril. Quickly, I struck a match. I was in my hall bedroom, midway between my bed and dresser. January 28th, last night, I did not take my usual dose of medicine, but I put the bottle on my dresser. I awoke when the clock was striking two a little earlier than my habit. I rose at once, took my matches, and walked a great space without encountering anything. The wonderful smell of flowers did not recur. Instead, I was suddenly aware that I was tasting something, a delicious morsel of sweetness. I stepped further and a new savor was upon my palate and so on. <laughs> I have lived all my life and always I have gone hungry until now. Then, suddenly, that indefinite fear came upon me. I lit a match and was back in my hall bedroom. I did not take my medicine. I am resolved not to do so any longer. I am feeling much better. January 29th, to bed as usual, matches in place, and I waked at half past one. I took the matchbox and traversed vast spaces. I neither smelled nor tasted, but I heard first uh, the murmur of a river. It seemed to come from behind the wall where the old picture hangs on. Ever on came the soothing sound of the waves, and then above the river, a song in an unknown tongue, and yet I understood, and above that, the pealing of crystal bells. It all filled me with the certainty of future bliss. Finally, the terror and the impulse to flee. The match, the hall bedroom. January 30th, today at the spa, I sat on the veranda sipping idly my mineral water. Mr. Wheatcroft. Oh, Mr. Addison, the newspaper man who I met three years ago in the city. Good to see you again, Wheatcroft. Taking the waters, are you? I stop here every year. Are you boarding on the avenue? What number? Uh, 240. 240? Yes. 240, do you know it? Indeed, I do. I stayed there myself once. But Wheatcroft, I must ask, what room do you occupy? The hall bedroom, third floor. Get out. Get out now. When last I heard of 240, foul play had taken place there, though nothing was ever proved. Two disappearances, and in each case, an occupant of that hall bedroom. The first was a very beautiful girl recuperating after a love disappointment. One morning she was gone, vanished into thin air. A thorough search was made, but she was never found. Well, that was before my day. But the second disappearance took place while I was inside the house. A fine young fellow who had overworked in college and taken sick. He had been in that room two weeks, then one morning, gone. There was a great 
hullabaloo. He had hinted that there was something strange about the room, but of course the police didn't think much of that. The boarding house was shut up. Six years ago, nobody would stay there, much less occupy that hall bedroom. I suppose the story has died out. Beware, Wheatcroft. You know me. I'm not superstitious, but no good ever comes from that hall bedroom. That night, I neither heard, nor smelled, nor tasted, but I felt. The dresser? But this was carved with beautiful wings as smooth as ivory, and yet not ivory. Walking on, I came to what was evidently a window. Not the window of my hall bedroom. I could see nothing. I only felt a soft, refreshing breeze. And then, without warning, my hands touched living beings. I felt the soft, silken texture of their garments, which swept around me, half enfolding me. A hand that I knew closed softly over mine. A familiar arm passed around me. I began to feel myself gently pulled forward. I struck a match. The hall bedroom. I wonder what had become of all those people and the young man and woman who occupied this room. I wonder if I had better stop. I wonder if this is all going too far. January 31st, tonight I saw, I saw more than I can describe. Something which nature has rightly kept hidden has been revealed, but it is not for me to disclose her secret. This much I will say, that doors and windows open into a place to which the outdoors that we know is but a vestibule. And there is something strange in respect to that picture. And there is a river upon which one could sail away. Tonight it flowed silently, for tonight I could only see. And I was right that I recognized the people from the night before. And it is true that the girl is very beautiful. And the boy is now strong and fine. Everything dazzled my eyes. I wonder if all my senses were to grasp it. I wonder if I were to survive. I wonder... There... The journal stopped, but no more. The next morning he was gone. We searched. We even tore down the wall behind the picture and found another room. Yes, the length of the whole bedroom and very narrow. No more than a thin closet. Uh, no window or door, empty, except for a piece of paper covered with numbers as if somebody had been doing arithmetic. The agent promised new wallpaper and paint, but I told him I wouldn't stay if he gave me the house. I moved, and I pray no bad luck follows me to my new house, but I made sure it has no hall bedroom. Whew. Weird. I wonder what happened to Mr. Wheatcroft. Who knows? Authors are like that sometimes. They just lay out big questions, but they don't always provide an answer. Yeah, I guess so. Well, you know, some ghost stories aren't written by just a normal author. They're just told generation after generation. Why don't you tell us one, Damien? I think I will. <laughs> in upstate New York, a young couple was returning home from a trip to New England in a carriage. As evening drew on, they knew they'd have to seek shelter for the night. They spied a light and turned their horse onto a small lane leading up a hill. A pleasant little house stood at the crest, and an old man and woman met them at the door. They welcomed the travelers and offered them a room. The old woman bustled about with tea and freshly baked cakes. The husband tried to pay, but the old couple refused anything from their fellow New Yorkers. The travelers woke early and tiptoed out, happily leaving a shiny new 50-cent piece on the center of the kitchen table. They drove a few miles before they broke their fast at a little restaurant in the next town. The husband mentioned the nice old couple to the fellow who ran the restaurant. Uh, where did you say that house was? They described it in exact detail. You must be mistaken. That whole place was destroyed by fire years ago, and old Mr. and Mrs. Brown lost their lives in the blaze. Horrible it was. Well, that couldn't be. They welcomed us in and we passed a pleasant night. As you say. Outside, they determined to clear up the mystery. They followed the same road and turned up the same small lane. It was overgrown with weeds, which they hadn't noticed before. 
The carriage climbed the hill to the crest, and they saw before them the burnt-out ruins of a small house. It had obviously not sheltered anyone for years. They gazed in shock until the husband said, I, I must have missed the turn. But his wife only stared fixedly before her. Then she gave a terrified scream and collapsed in his arms, for there, in the center of the charred kitchen table, gleamed a shiny new fifty-cent piece. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Say, Damien, you just moved to St. Paul, didn't you? Sure did. Yeah, over by Summit Avenue. Mm -hmm. Did you know that a lot of those houses are haunted? No, Craig, mm -hmm. but I bet you're going to tell me. Sure am. One old mansion has this really cute little cupola on top. It was built by the owner of a steamboat company so he could watch his boats coming and going up and down the Mississippi River. But in recent years, people have sometimes noticed a light shining from the cupola late at night. Funny thing, there's no light fixture up there. There's not even any electricity. Huh. Oh, a few doors down, there's another house that has had repeated hauntings over the years. A renter in a basement apartment once awoke to feeling cold, dead fingers pressed against his forehead. There are reports of apparitions that just melt into the walls. Even a phantom dog who would jump up on the bed every night after the lights go out. That's... Freaky. Oh, there's more. <laughs> Some of the mansions have ballrooms or theaters up on their top floors, and in one of these, young F. Scott Fitzgerald, who grew up in the neighborhood, wrote plays that his friends would perform there. But apparently, one play was so bad that all of his buddies just teased and taunted him until Scotty burst into tears and ran from the house. Okay, Kirk, that's not a ghost story. That's just kids being mean. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. But years later, after Fitzgerald had died, young Scotty was seen running down the stairs of the house. People heard him crying, and in the yard, poof, they saw him disappear. Later owners found this so disturbing that when they renovated, they removed the steps that led up to the attic theater. But Scotty continued to float down where the staircase had been. Finally, they decided to have an exorcism, and then he was seen no more. However, sometimes at night, after the family has gone to bed, neighbors have noticed lights like Christmas tree ornaments moving slowly down the hallway, past the windows by the stairs. Okay, Craig, you're kind of creeping me out. This is where I live. Totally understandable. Just one more. At another house, the owner often hosted these small concerts, and one of the singers once asked him, you know, whenever we're here, there's this beautiful old lady who comes in late and sits at the back. She seems to enjoy the music, but she always arrives after we've started and never stays afterwards. Could you ask her to stay? We would really like to meet her. The host responded, I would if I could, but she's been dead for 30 years. Oh, thanks, Craig. No problem, Damien. <laughs> hey, our next story is all about a haunted house and you get to tell it. The Judge's House by Bram Stoker, same guy who wrote Dracula. When his university exams drew near, Malcolm Malcolmson made up his mind to go somewhere to study. Some little town with no distractions. He bought a ticket for the first town he did not know. Fenchurch. He asked the local agent for the quietest house available. One place certainly satisfied. In fact, quiet was not the word. Desolation. An old, rambling place with small, high windows and surrounded by a massive brick wall. Ah, yes. I'm delighted to read it to you, young man. It's been so long empty, a kind of absurd prejudice has grown up about the place. I care nothing about absurd prejudices. Here's a month's rent. Oh. And now, a good servant. Hello, Mrs. Dempster. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, the empty house at the far end of the lane. Not the judge's house. Yes, with the walls and the high windows. Why? I many a year, the home of a judge held in great terror for his harsh sentences as to what there is against the house. Well, 
There is something. My dear Mrs. Dempster, a student preparing for mathematical examinations is too concerned with numbers to be concerned with mysterious somethings. Well, if you were my boy, I wouldn't let you spend the night there. Not if I had to pull the big alarm bell on the roof myself. <laughs> Malcolm Malcolmson just laughed. Once there, he arranged everything in the great dining room. Bedroom, sitting room, study, really. He didn't need anything more. Mrs. Dempster plodded about heavily. Evil lurks here, and bogeys too. Bogeys is the evil that hides in the heart of things. Rats and mice and beetles lurk at that old woodwork. Mice and beetles lurk. Rats is bogeys, and bogeys is rats. Evil lurks in this place. When Malcolm returned from his walk, Mrs. Dempster had gone, but the room was clean, a fire crackled in the old hearth, and the table was spread for supper. Afterwards, he got out his books and sat down to really study. He went till eleven o'clock, then made himself a pot of tea and stretched out in a great, high-backed, carved oak chair by the fire, which threw quaint shadows on the woodwork, the paintings coated in the thick dust, the dangling rope for the great alarm bell. Malcolm marveled at this weird old place. That was when he noticed the noise for the first time. Scratching behind the old woodwork, above the ceiling, under the floor. Bogies lurk in the heart of things evil lurk. Lurking evil doesn't concern me. Malcolm grew accustomed to the scratching, like the ticking of a clock, and returned to his work. Finally, he looked up. The noise had ceased. The fire was just a deep red glow. Then, oh my god! There, on the carved oak chair, sat an enormous rat, steadily glaring at him. Malcolm made a motion, but it didn't stir. He made the gesture of throwing something. It didn't flinch, but showed its pointed teeth angrily, and its cruel eyes gleamed. Malcolm seized the fireplace poker and ran to kill it. The rat, with a squeak of hate, jumped up the rope and disappeared into the darkness. Instantly, the scratching in the wall resumed. <laughs> well, that was odd. But with the creature gone, Malcolm retired to bed and slept heavily until Mrs. Dempster's arrival. After a strong cup of coffee, he took his books, began his morning walk, bringing a few sandwiches lest he should not return till dinner time. He stopped by the land agent to thank him. Oh, you mustn't overwork, sir. You look pale. Uh, how did you pass the night? Oh, fine. Uh, your absurd prejudices and Mrs. Dempster's sup things didn't worry me. Though the rats had a circus. One wicked old devil sat on my chair and wouldn't go until I took the poker to him. <laughs> An old devil. The devil, perhaps. <laughs> but... You must let me know if anything untoward is lurking about. That evening, the scampering began earlier. How busy they are! They squeak and scratch and gnaw. Their eyes shone like tiny lamps from the cracks and crannies. But rats never bothered him, so Malcolm continued his studies. Finally, he stopped. As on the previous night, all was silent. He looked at the chair by the fire. Empty. Malcolm laughed <laughs> and settled into the great oak chair with his nightly pot of tea. He fingered the alarm bell rope beside him and noticed how pliable and strong it was. You could hang a man with this. Just then, the rope twitched. Glaring down at him perched the great rat. Suddenly, without warning, the rat dropped right on top of him. Oh! Malcolm bolted away. He turned back to see the rat reclaim the chair. Malcolm grabbed his advanced algebra textbook and flung it. With a quick move, the rodent dodged aside. Malcolm threw trigonometry and almost hit its tail. Logarithms nearly went into the fire. At last, as he stood with his last book poised, the rat squeaked in fear. Malcolm hurled the volume with great force and struck the rat a resounding blow. With a malevolent hiss, the rat ran up the rope. Malcolm saw it disappear through a hole above one of the great pictures, obscured through its coating of dust and grime. The triumphant student collected his books. As he took up his last one, his successful one, he started. 
Bible my mother gave me. How strange. And as the rats in the walls renewed their activities, Malcolm fell asleep in exhaustion. Wake up, sir! Oh. Oh, Mrs. Dempster. Oh, you look as if you had a nightmare. Uh, I must have fallen asleep at my work. Yeah. I say, hmm? when I'm out today, would you clean those pictures, especially that one by the fireplace? As you wish, sir. Uh. Till late in the afternoon, Malcolm studied in the shaded walk. His confidence returned. In this state of satisfaction, he met Dr. Thornhill from the village, who plunged into such a series of questions that Malcolm wondered if his presence was not an accident. Did the land agent or Mrs. Dempster ask you to come here and advise me? Both, but they didn't intend you to know it. They worried about your being there alone and absurd prejudice about the place. Now, I was a keen student in my time, so I may take the liberty of a college man and ask if you are indeed all right. Okay, as they say in America. <laughs> And Malcolm described all that he had happened in the last two nights. The rat always went up the rope of the alarm bell. Always? I suppose you know what that rope first was. No. It was used by the hangman for the victims of the judge's rancor. Mark the rope. I fear no good of it, but give that alarm bell a good pull if you ever need our help. That evening grew cold. A heavy wind arose. Malcolm examined the cleaned painting and was instantly transfixed. A portrait of a strong and powerful judge dressed in robes. His face was merciless, evil. The eyes glowed malignantly. Malcolm saw in them the very eyes of the great rat. To his shock, the judge sat in the same carved oak chair by the stone fireplace with the rope from the ceiling, its end coiled on the floor. Troubled, Malcolm worked for an hour or so, accompanied by the scratching of the rats, while the wind became a gale and the gale a storm. The old house creaked and the wind blew through the chimneys, producing strange, unearthly sounds. Even the great alarm bell on the roof felt the force of the wind, for the hangman's rope rose and fell slightly. Malcolm picked it up, Suddenly, it twitched. Just out of his reach, the great rat clung to the rope, gnawing it until the severed rope fell, clattering to the oak floor. For an instant, the great rat remained like a knob or a tassel before disappearing into the woodwork. Malcolm felt a pang of terror as the possibility of contacting the outer world was cut off. Turning, he dropped the rope. In the center of the judge's picture, was a great patch of bare canvas. The figure of the judge had disappeared. Malcolm, his knees shaking, looked to the real chair. There, in robes of scarlet and ermine, sat the judge himself, his eyes glaring and a smile of triumph on his cruel mouth. Malcolm stood breathless with horror-struck eyes. Slowly, the judge rose and picked up the rope, fashioning one end into a noose. Then, with a swift move, he shifted in front of the door. Trapped, Malcolm tried to think. The door barred the high windows. He saw the judge raise the noose and throw it. Malcolm darted aside like a rat. Again, the judge raised the rope and threw it, and again, the student just managed to evade it. This went on many times, the judge seeming to play as a cat does with a mouse. Meanwhile, the rope of the great alarm bell became laden with hissing rats. More and more poured through the small hole in the ceiling, so that with their weight the bell was beginning to sway. Hark, a tiny clang. Malcolm looked up in hope, and just then the noose throttled his neck. The judge's icy fingers clasped his throat. The noose tightened, tightened. The judge hoisted the rigid, choking student onto the oak chair. He caught the end of the swaying rope of the alarm bell. He shook off the shrieking rats, knotted the end of the noose around the hanging rope, and stepping down, kicked away the chair. The townsfolk woke to the heavy, repeated clang of the alarm bell. Lights appeared. A crowd hurried through the storm. They pounded on the door of the judge's house. Getting no reply, they burst in and poured into the great dining room. There, at the end of the rope, swung the body of the student. 
while on the face of the judge in the picture glowed a malignant smile. And the bell tolled on and on and on. Poor Malcolm. I know. Ghost stories, huh? Sorry, folks. Maybe we should do a funnier one next, mm -hmm. without rats. The Canterville Ghost by Oscar Wilde. Mm. When Mr. Otis, the American minister, leased Canterville Estate, everyone told him that it was very foolish, as there was no doubt the place was haunted. Even Lord Canterville confessed, Oh, we have not lived there since the Dowager Duchess was frightened into a fit by two skeleton hands placed upon her shoulders. My lord, I come from a modern country where we have everything money can buy. If a ghost exists, we'll ship it home for one of our public museums. I'll put him on the stage. Oh, I fear that the ghost exists since 1584, in fact. Sir, there is no such thing as ghosts. So the American family arrived. Mrs. Otis, a celebrated New York belle, was an excellent example that we have everything in common with America nowadays, hmm. except, of course, language. Their eldest son christened Washington by his parents in a moment of patriotism, which he never ceased to regret, had qualified him for diplomacy by leading the balls at Newport for three successive seasons. Miss Virginia was lithe and lovely as a fawn. And last came the twins, who were usually called the Stars and Stripes, as they were always flapping about. <laughs> It was a fine July day when the family entered Canterville Estate, but as they approached, the sky suddenly became overcast. A curious stillness seemed to hold the atmosphere, and a great flight of crows passed over their heads. Standing on the front steps was an old woman neatly dressed in black. Mrs. Omni, the housekeeper, curtsied low. Welcome to Canterville. <clears throat> They followed her through the fine Tudor hall into the library, where Mrs. Otis caught sight of a dull red stain on the floor. Mrs. Omni, something has been spilt. Yes, madam, blood has been spilt. How horrid, it must be removed at once. It is the blood of Lady Eleanor de Canterville, murdered on that very spot by her own husband in 1575. Sir Simon survived her nine years, then disappeared under mysterious circumstances. His guilty spirit still haunts Canterville. The bloodstain cannot be removed and is much admired by tourists. But Washington Otis rapidly scoured the floor with a small stick of what looked like a black cream. In a few minutes, no trace of the bloodstain could be seen. There, I knew Pinkerton's champion stain remover would clean it up in no time. Just then, a terrible flash of lightning lit up the somber room. A crash of thunder made them all start, and Mrs. Omni fainted. Ow! My dear husband, what can we do with a housekeeper who faints? Charge it to her, like breakages. She won't faint after that. And in a few minutes, Mrs. Omni certainly came to Ow! Beware! I have seen things that would make any Christian's hair stand on end. Beware. I assure you, Mrs. Umney, neither Mrs. Otis nor I have the slightest fear of ghosts. So, after invoking the blessings of Providence and making arrangements for an increase of salary, the old housekeeper tottered off. The storm raged fiercely, and the next morning they found the bloodstain once again on the floor. Cannot be the fault of the Pinkertons, for I've tried it on everything. Washington rubbed the stain out a second time, but it appeared again. And on the third morning also, although the library had been locked up by Mr. Otis himself. Then, the next night, Mr. Otis was awakened by a curious noise in the hallway. It sounded like the clang of metal and footsteps coming nearer every moment. He put on his slippers, took a small oblong vial out of his dressing case, and opened the door. Right in front of him, he saw, in the bleak moonlight, an old man of terrible aspect. 
His eyes were red burning coals. Long gray hair fell over his shoulders in matted coils. His garments were soiled and ragged, and from his wrists and ankles hung heavy manacles. Sir, you've got to oil those chains. Here's a bottle of Tammany Lubricator. One application should do it. There are several testimonials to that effect on the wrapper. Good night. For a moment, the Canterville ghost stood motionless, and then, dashing the bottle violently upon the polished floor, he fled down the corridor, uttering hollow groans and admitting a ghastly green light. But as he reached the top of the staircase, a door flung open, two little white-robed figures appeared, the stars and stripes, and a large pillow whizzed by his head. Hastily adopting the fourth dimension of space, the ghost vanished, and the house became quite quiet. On reaching his small secret chamber, the ghost leaned up against a moonbeam. Never in a brilliant career of 300 years had he been so grossly insulted. He thought of all his accomplishments, including his most celebrated performance, the furor he had excited one lovely June day by bowling upon the lawn using his own bones. And now some wretched modern Americans offered him Tammany lubricator and threw pillows? Oh, no ghost in history had ever been treated in this manner. He vowed vengeance. However, for the rest of the week, the family was undisturbed, the only thing that excited any attention being the chameleon-like renewal of the bloodstain on the floor of the locked library. Some mornings it was a bright red, then it would be a dusty rose, now a rich purple, and once a bright emerald green. <laughs> These kaleidoscopic changes amused the family very much, except little Virginia, who for some reason very nearly cried the morning it was emerald green. The second appearance of the ghost was on Saturday night. A fearful crash in the hall. Rushing downstairs, the men found a large suit of old armor had fallen to the stone floor, while crawling out beneath it was the Canterville ghost, rubbing his knees with acute agony. The twins, having loosened the bolt that held the armor in place, now brought out their pea shooters and discharged pellets at him with that accuracy of aim which can only be attained by long and careful practice on a school teacher while their father aimed his revolver and in accordance with Californian etiquette shouted, Put up your hands! The ghost with a wild shriek of rage swept through them like a mist. On reaching the staircase, he gave his celebrated peal of demonic laughter. It was said to have turned Lord Raker's wig gray in a single night and had certainly made three of Lady Canterville's French governesses give their notice before their month was up, but hardly had the fearful echo died away when a door opened and Mrs. Otis greeted him. You are far from well. Here is a bottle of Dr. Dopel's syrup. If it is indigestion, you will find it a most excellent remedy. The ghost glared at her and began at once to make preparations to turn into a large black dog, an accomplishment for which he was justly renowned. The sound of approaching footsteps, however, made him hesitate, so he contented himself with becoming faintly phosphorescent and retired to a comfortable lead coffin where he broke down utterly. For some days, he hardly stirred at all, except to keep the blood stain in proper repair. At last, he resolved to make a third attempt to frighten the American family. Oh, he selected his celebrated character of Reckless Rupert, the Headless Earl. His plan was to gibber at them from the foot of their beds, stab himself three times in the throat to the sound of slow music, and finally to crawl around, shrieking and flinging his eyeballs at them, which on more than one occasion had produced a great effect. As midnight sounded, he sallied forth, seeing the twins' door ajar. He knew their doom had come. Wishing an effective entrance, he flung the door wide open. 
but a large bucket of water fell right down on him, wetting him to the bone and just missing his left shoulder. He then heard shrieks of laughter from the four-post bed. He retreated down the hallway to terrorize the other family members, but turning a corner fell back, flinging up his long bony hands with a piteous wail of terror. Right in front of him was a horrible specter. Its head was round and lumpen. One shrouded hand clutched a purple heart, and in the other a blade of gleaming steel. Well, Never having seen a ghost before, he naturally was terribly frightened. Later, however, the brave Canterville spirit asserted itself, and he determined to speak to the other ghost as soon as it was daylight. Feeling that, after all, two ghosts are better than one, and with the aid of his new friend he might safely grapple with the twins. On reaching the spot that morning, however, a terrible sight met his gaze. The horrible head was merely a carved pumpkin. A bedsheet wrapped round a garden rake formed the body with an old kitchen knife and a rotten turnip for the purple heart. He had been tricked, foiled, outwitted. In his shame, he escaped into the great iron stove, which fortunately for him was not lit, and he made his way through the flues and chimneys, arriving at his own room in a terrible state of dirt, disorder, and despair. His nerves were completely shattered, and he started at the slightest noise. He even gave up on the blood stain. If the Otis family did not want it, they clearly did not deserve it. They were evidently people on a low material plane of existence and quite incapable of appreciating the symbolic value of sensuous phenomena. For three weeks, he took every possible precaution against being heard or seen. He removed his boots trod as lightly as possible, wore a discreet, discreet black velvet cloak, and was careful to use the Tammany lubricator. He felt a little humiliated at first, but afterwards saw that there was a great deal to be said for it. But one day, Virginia was passing the tapestry chamber. To her immense surprise, there sat the Canterville ghost. He was leaning on a window, looking so forlorn that little Virginia was filled with pity. I am sorry for you, but my brothers are going back to school tomorrow, and then if you behave yourself, no one will annoy you. Oh, it is absurd asking me to behave myself. I must rattle my chains and groan through keyholes. It is my only reason for existing. It is no reason at all for existing. You know you have been very wicked. Mrs. Umney told us that you have killed your wife. Yes, but it was a purely family matter and concerned no one else. It is very wrong to kill anyone. Oh, I hate the cheap severity of abstract Puritan ethics. I don't think it was very nice of her brothers to starve me to death. <gasps> starve you to death? Oh, Mr. Ghost. I, I, I mean, Sir Simon, mm -hmm. would you like a sandwich? Or... No, thank you. I never eat anything now. You are much nicer than the rest of your horrid, rude, vulgar, dishonest family. Stop! It is you who are dishonest. You know you stole my paints to redo that ridiculous blood stain. First, you took all my reds, then you took the emerald green and the yellow, and finally, I had nothing left but blue and white, and could only do moonlit scenes, which are always depressing and not at all easy to paint. I never told on you, though it was most ridiculous. Who ever heard of emerald green blood? Well, really, what am I to do? The best thing you can do is to emigrate and improve your mind. Well, my father will give you free passage, and though I'm told there is a heavy duty on spirits, there will be no difficulty at customs as all the officers are Democrats. Once in New York, you are sure to be a great success. Perhaps you can join a road show. I don't think I should like America. Oh, I'm so lonely and tired. I want to sleep, and I cannot. That's quite absurd. It is very difficult sometimes to keep awake, especially at church, but there's no difficulty at all about sleeping. Why, even babies know how to do it, and they are not at all clever. I have not slept for 300 years. Poor, poor ghost. Have you no place to rest in peace? Mm. Beyond the pines is a little garden, 
There, the great white stars of the hemlock flowers. There, the nightingale sings all night long. The cold crystal moon looks down, and the yew tree spreads giant arms over the sleepers. You mean the garden of death? Yes. To forget time. To forgive life. To be at peace. You could help. You can open the portals of death's house, for love is always with you, and love is stronger than death. Have you ever read the old prophecy on the library window? When a golden girl can win, prayer from out the lips of sin, when the almond tree shall flower, and the child shall know her power, mm -hmm. then shall all the house be still, and peace will come to Canterville. You must pray for my soul, and then the angel of death will have mercy on me. You will see fearful shapes and hear wicked voices, but they will not harm you, for against the purity of a child, the powers of darkness cannot prevail. I am not afraid. I will ask the angel to have mercy on you. Taking her hand with old-fashioned grace, he kissed it. His fingers were cold as ice, and his lips burned like fire, but Virginia did not falter. He led her across the dusky room, stopped and muttered some strange words. She saw the wall slowly fading away like a mist, and a great black cavern gaped. A bitter cold wind swept around them. Quick, quick, or it will be too late. And in a moment, the paneling closed up behind them. When the bell rang for tea, Virginia did not come down. When six o'clock was struck, Virginia did not appear. Mrs. Otis became quite agitated and sent the boys out to look for her, while she and Mr. Otis searched every room in the house, but they could find no trace. Mr. Otis sprang into American action. He sent off Washington and two men to scour the district and dispatch telegrams to all the police inspectors in the county. The pond was dragged and the whole estate thoroughly gone over, but all without result. It was evident that Virginia might be lost to them. After a melancholy dinner, Mr. Otis ordered them all to bed, saying, I will telegraph in the morning to Scotland Yard. Just as they were leaving the dining room, a dreadful crash of thunder shook the house. A strain of unearthly music floated through the air. A panel at the top of the staircase flew open, and out onto the landing with a little box in her hand stepped Virginia. Good heavens, child, where have you been? Your mother and I were frightened to death. Papa, Mama, I have been with the ghost. He is dead, and you must come and see him. He had been most wicked, but was very sorry for all that he had done, and he gave me this box of beautiful jewels before he died. And turning round, she led them through the opening down a narrow secret corridor to a little low room with one tiny grated window. Embedded in the wall was a huge iron ring, and chained to it a gaunt skeleton stretched out on the stone floor. Virginia knelt down beside the skeleton while the rest of the family looked on in wonder, glancing out the window, the stars or stripes suddenly exclaimed, Hey, that old withered almond tree has blossomed. I can see the flowers in the moonlight. <gasps> the ghost has been forgiven. And indeed. Four nights later, a funeral procession started from Canterville Estate. Lord Canterville sat in the first carriage with little Virginia. Then came the United States minister and his wife. Then Washington and the Stars and Stripes. And in the last carriage was Mrs. Omni. It was generally felt that as she had been frightened by the ghost for more than 50 years... I've got a right to see the last of him. A deep grave had been dug in the corner of the churchyard just under the old yew tree. As the coffin was lowered, Virginia stepped forward and laid on it a large armful of white and pink almond blossoms. As she did so, the moon shot out from behind a cloud and the nightingales began to sing. Virginia looked up. The Canterville ghost is finally able to sleep. The End but not quite. We have one more story for you, but we wanna thank you for spending this time with us today. And when the time is right, we hope you come back and join us at Yellow Tree Theater. But now, 
For our final story, here is Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. It is impossible to say how the idea first entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell on me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You think me mad. Mad men know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night at midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then when I made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. Oh, I moved it slowly, very very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight, but I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible for me to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch, and I kept pushing on steadily, steadily. I had my head in, was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle. Finally, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern until at length a simple dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot out from the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, a dull blue with a vidious veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. Then, suddenly, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. 
Meantime, the heartbeat grew quicker and quicker, louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme, and now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leapt into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there for many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned and I worked on hastily. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all underneath. I then replaced the board so cleverly that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot, whatever. I had been too wary for that. When I made an end to all these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it and came in, out with a light heart. For what had I now to he he fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office and they had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled and bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took the visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues. While I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, reposed upon the very spot beneath which lay the corpse of my victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and chatted. The ringing became more distinct. I, I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but yet it grew and continued in definiteness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. It was a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased, louder, louder, and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard it not? No, no, they heard, they suspected, they knew. Uh, they were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I still think, but anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I, I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark. Louder. 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 Villains, dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Here, here, tear up the plagues. It is the beating of his hideous heart. <laughs>